Hey everyone, before we get into the actual video, I just want to say that I hope you all are all safe and healthy. Being a YouTuber, I get to hermit myself away in my apartment, but I know many of you out there don't have that luxury. If you do need to be out and around people, all I have to ask is that you make good decisions for the safety of yourself and others. Wash your hands, clean your phone, and please don't hoard essentials. I'm looking at you, toilet paper people. Best case scenario, you just stay inside for two weeks and binge watch YouTube. It's not like I'm biased or anything. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Stay safe, guys. Now, for the actual content of this video, we are going to be taking a look at Contagion, a movie that has become terrifyingly more relevant as of late. If you don't know what Contagion is about or have never seen it, the premise of the movie is actually pretty straightforward. A disease called MEV1 sweeps over the planet and threatens to kill 1 in 12 people on Earth. But the weird thing about today's video is that we're not actually going to talk much about the writing of the movie. Instead, we are going to use a scene from Contagion as an example of how a novel editor might go about formatting a scene. And for anyone new to the channel, that novel editor would be me. So here is the game plan. We are going to watch a short one minute scene from Contagion. You will notice that there is no dialogue in this scene. It only consists of visual storytelling. After we finish the scene, we are then going to recreate all that visual storytelling through descriptive writing. The goal is to take all that information that was shown during the scene and replicate it as closely as possible in a novelized format. This task is really a mix of both editing and creative writing. However, before we actually read through the written version, I will break down my approach and thought process to editing and writing. The reason that I think this is important and could be helpful is because it might give insight and guidance into how many of you could look at scenes in your own writing. As a professional editor, there are very particular aspects in pieces that I look for in fiction, some of which might not be easily recognizable to less experienced writers. Hopefully this video has some neat tips and tricks that you guys could make use of. So without any further blabbering from me, let's get into it. Alright, pretty cool stuff, and although it may not seem like it, there is a lot to work with. If you want to skip over my explanation and just read the novelized scene, that's fine too. If you're sticking around though, we can start our breakdown of all the components and decisions that go into novelizing that scene. So, the first thing that I always think about when constructing or editing a scene is the POV. What perspective will the reader be experiencing the events of the narrative from? The best way to go about this is to consider your characters. It's usually good practice to put your readers in the shoes of the character that experiences the most significant events in your narrative. This way, the reader also gets to experience those events. So, with that in mind, let's look at all of the characters from this scene in Contagion. We have the pilot of the bulldozer, the bats, the pigs, the farmers, the chefs, and the restaurant patrons. Now, if you're thinking that is a lot, you are correct, and we cannot possibly use all of them as POV characters. What we will have to do then is narrow down our candidates of characters to only those who are most crucial to the events of the plot. And an easy way to tell if a character is crucial or not is to remove them from the story. If the plot still functions without them, they are not crucial. 
If the plot cannot function without them, they are crucial. So, out of all of those characters that we talked about, who is crucial to the plot of the scene? Well, the plot of the scene is the origin and transmission of the virus, so we must choose characters that are involved with that process. With that said, the bat that picked up the banana started the viral chain. The pig that ate that dropped banana continued the viral chain. The chef and the patron that shook the chef's hand also continued the viral chain. So, due to their interaction with the virus, these are our four crucial characters, and therefore, our four candidates to place the POV on. Now, the two most prevalent POV styles are over-the-shoulder and omniscient, and the strengths and weaknesses of these styles help to inform us of what character we might choose to center the POV on. Over-the-shoulder POV is nearly self-explanatory. The reader experiences the events of the narrative as if they are perched on a character's shoulder. This means that a reader will only experience things that that character experiences. If something happens in a room where the POV character is not, the reader won't know. If another character has a thought that the POV character is not aware of, the reader won't know. In an over-the-shoulder POV style, the reader only gets the POV character's thoughts and experiences. Many writers choose this style because it closely mirrors reality. And a general rule in writing is that the closer to reality something is, the more believable it is. And that's always a good thing in fiction. However, by this time, I have already figured out that over-the-shoulder POV is not our best option. Why? Well, by definition of how over-the-shoulder POV is built, it must stay with one character. The only time over-the-shoulder POV can switch is during a chapter break. Since we have already determined that there are four crucial characters that must be included for the plot to function, that means we would need four separate over-the-shoulder POV chapters. In my assessment, that's just too much. For the recreation of the scene, I want to stick as closely as possible to the source material, meaning I want to depict everything in one scene. Four chapters would be four scenes, which means that over-the-shoulder POV is out. That leaves us with the increasingly rare Omniscient POV. Like over-the-shoulder POV, Omniscient POV is very self-explanatory. But that's actually where the similarities between the two POVs end. Omniscient POV allows a narrator, and therefore the reader, to potentially have complete knowledge of anything and everything that goes on within a fiction. The perspective can jump between characters, locations, and even timelines, all within a single chapter, heck, maybe even a single paragraph. Many writers stay away from omniscient POV because allowing the reader access to that much information makes it difficult to maintain any mystery or tension. However, the strengths of omniscient POV will serve our purposes well. With it, we can follow all four crucial characters within one scene. Omniscient POV is our best bet. But that's still only half of the POV we still have to decide which person the POV will be written in. Luckily, this step is actually pretty simple. Let's break it down. By and large, there are three person styles to POV writing, and you have probably heard of them all. There is first person, second person, and third person. First person uses I, we. Second person uses you. Third person, the most common, uses he, she, it, they. Now, believe it or not, each of these POVs has a different effect on the narrative. First person puts you directly in the shoes of a character and is the most intimate style of storytelling. I grabbed the sword, I fought the man, I killed the man. When done well, it can literally trick your brain into associating yourself directly with that POV character, immersing you in the story. Lots of young adult fiction is written in first person so that young readers can identify and feel connected to a young main character. First person creates a situation where every word on the page is funneled through the POV character's experience, meaning that every sentence is a chance to learn more about them and how they think. Second person makes a reader feel like they are being directly addressed and told a story by another person. You grab the sword, you fought the man, you killed the man. Second person is what I like to call intimately dissociative. You are still technically in the shoes of a character. You just feel farther away from them because instead of actively experiencing the events of the narrative with that character, you are being told those events by someone else. 
The best way to understand how this might make a reader feel on a conceptual basis is to think of sleepwalking. While it is still definitely you that did the actions, you were asleep, so someone else has to tell you about them. Lastly, third person makes a reader feel like they are a fly on the wall. He grabbed the sword, he fought the man, he killed the man. It is the least intimate of all the POV styles, but that's not always a bad thing. If you have a POV character who is drastically different from a reader, like a different life form, or you have a POV whom you want to remain mysterious, the distance that third person style allows is really valuable. Third person is the style that is most conducive to building and maintaining tension, because while a character may have information that undercuts a huge reveal, the reader doesn't have to be given that information. So, with all that down, what would be the best complement to our chosen omniscient POV style? Well, a first person omniscient POV style would basically put the reader directly in the shoes of an all-knowing being, aka God. While this is cool in some narratives, I would want to stay away from that just so as not to distract from the events of the virus. So first person is out. Second person omniscient isn't much of an option either, as I don't want to make a reader feel like they are a bat or a pig or a chef. What we are left with is the simplest option, third person omniscient. This style means that the viewpoint will be anywhere and any time that we want, while also being distanced from the characters. Now, let's talk about the direction of the scene, because our chosen style of third person omniscient POV has a bit of a learning curve. One of the benefits to choosing a POV style that sticks close to a single character, such as first person or over the shoulder, is that they provide steady direction to the scene. What do I mean by that? Well, because we stick close by a character, the reader experiences events one at a time like the character does. For example, a story sequence could be, I invited her over, I changed my clothes, I answered the door, I gave her a kiss. There is a clear, linear progression from one event and moment to the next. However, the freedom of an omniscient POV style sometimes adds a lot of complexity to the mix. Since the perspective can be any place and any time, the events of the narrative no longer have to be linear. For example, he invited her over, she accepted his invitation, he changed his clothes, she grabbed a bite to eat, she hailed a cab, he changed his clothes, she rang the bell, he answered the door, he gave her a kiss. Even though this is the same event as previously stated, the reader is experiencing it over two different perspectives. Instead of linearly following one character and their actions, the reader now jumps back and forth between two characters and two timelines, which can cause the feeling of a lack of direction. Omniscient POV can cause difficulty for a reader to follow along, because where a regular human viewpoint is linear, omniscient POV is omnidirectional. Luckily, there is an easy writing approach to combat this difficulty. Simplicity. Remember, we chose Omniscient POV because it allows us to switch between our four crucial characters. Just because Omniscient POV style affords us a whole bunch of other freedoms doesn't mean we have to make use of them. For the purpose of a clear, concise scene, we will still remain as linear in our described events as possible. That means we try to stick to one character at a time. Next, we need to decide which tense to tell the story. Like much of the other things we have talked about, tense choice has an effect on the narrative. Present tense is the most active and immersive. Past tense is distance and tension building. There are other tenses that can be used, like future, but they are so uncommon that I won't even bother addressing them. Fortunately, our tense question is pretty cut and dry. Since the source scene takes place in the past relative to the events of the film, we will choose past tense. The last aspect of the scene that we will pin down is probably the most nuanced, but also the most important. We are going to determine the voice of the narrator. Now, I know that might sound very general, but here is what I mean. People, for the most part, read to be entertained, and there are only two factors in a written fiction that contribute to entertainment. One is the events within the fiction, and the other is how those events are described. For example, the written event of Geralt of Rivia fighting the Striga is entertaining on its face. Geralt is a cool character, the Striga is a cool enemy, and the fight between them is a cool event. As long as the description of their fight clearly presents what is happening, the reader will probably be entertained by the event alone. 
However, not all scenes within a fiction are innately entertaining. Many scenes are mundane and have to be written to be entertaining. This is where the voice of the narrator comes in. If a writer uses literary techniques to make the narrative engaging, even mundane actions like fly swatting or opening a jar can become entertaining. These literary techniques could be assonance, alliteration, repetition, simile, metaphor, parallelism, hyperbole, and many more. And use of each of these techniques contributes to the personality or voice of the narrator. In simple terms, the less exciting the events of the narrative are, the more entertaining the narrator should be. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, shouldn't the narrator in prose always be entertaining? Short answer, yes, but there is a bit of nuance to that. The more distinctive the voice of your narrator, and therefore the greater their personality, the more the reader will focus on them as a presence on the page. This is fine if you're describing mundane actions like walking or cleaning, but becomes a bit of a problem if you are describing a pivotal character moment in your plot. Narrative voices with big personalities grab attention, and sometimes you want the reader to be focused squarely on the events of the narrative and the emotions of the characters. This is the tightrope that advanced writers have to walk. You need to make the voice of your narrative entertaining enough to be engaging, but reserved enough to let the narrative shine, and this balancing act is different for every single piece of fiction. So, with all that said, let's consider the events of the contagion scene to understand how strong or reserved the narrative voice needs to be. Well, between bats flying, pigs eating, and chefs shaking hands, it's pretty clear that there is not a lot of exciting action going on. By recognizing that, we can determine that plenty of literary techniques will need to be employed to maintain entertainment, meaning that the narrative voice and personality will need to be strong. So, let's recap everything that we have decided on. Our crucial characters are the bat, the pig, the chef, and the patron. The POV style is omniscient, told from a third-person perspective. The direction of the scene will be linear. The tense of the scene will be past tense and the voice of the narrator will be strong with a lot of personality. These components make up the structure that our scene will be built around. Keep all these things in mind, because now I will read through the written version of the scene based around these guidelines. If you need to go back and watch the actual scene from Contagion one more time so it's fresh in your mind, this would be the time. If not, we can jump right into the novelized version of Day 1. There are four names you're going to have to pay attention to. Boris, Harry, Cho, and Beth. We can start with Harry, seeing as the contagion-fueled near collapse of humanity is his fault. Well, that actually is a bit unfair. Harry definitely had his part to play, but by and large, he was just minding his business, hanging upside down from his bed, soaking up the moonlight of a warm night. He most likely would have stayed there too, had it not been for the bulldozer that came to knock over his home. Now, before you wrench your heart for Harry, don't. He's a bat hanging around the forests of Eastern Asia. This was not the first tree to be felled that he once called home, and it certainly wouldn't be the last. Such is the life of a fruit bat living in a zone of aggressive deforestation. But this was a special night for Harry, one that he might not remember, but history would. See, for his rather diminutive size, Harry was ravenous. Anytime he could shove something in his mouth, he made sure to fit one or two extra pieces just to be safe. Now, if Harry were asleep, his hunger wouldn't be a problem, but very few living beings can maintain a slumber when a tree is snatched from underneath them. Harry, understandably a bit startled after being awoken so rudely, thought the best thing to calm his nerves was, of course, food. But not just any food. Such a dramatic arousal from sleep made Harry desire something special, so he focused his beady little black eyes and flapped his flimsy black wings all the way to his favorite banana tree. Harry was practically salivating. The bundle of bananas that he landed on was three times his size. He could gorge himself for hours. But then, the jewel of the bunch caught his eye. Tucked away in a nearby bundle was a banana with the tip of its peel pulled away leaving bare the soft flesh underneath. And that flesh, open to the air and musk of the jungle, had curdled into a gray, foaming finger. Harry couldn't resist. 
He clamped down his jaws around the banana to take his delicious prize into mouth, but had an epiphany as soon as he did. What's to stop this tree from falling too, thought Harry. Such a delicious meal would be utterly ruined if his perch gave way underneath him. That notion was all it took for Harry to take to the skies again, curdled banana still in mouth, to find a place to dine in peace. There were a million trees for him to choose from, but each was just as vulnerable as the last. None of them would do. But that's when Harry found a great metal construct with a great metal canopy. It looked just dirty enough to ward off any wandering bulldozers. Perfect. Harry flew his way inside, found himself a steel beam to relax on, and gave his banana treasure one last loving look. Before he dropped it. It fell too fast for him to do anything about, slamming into the ground below before Harry even knew what happened. And this is where the second name comes in. Boris. See, Harry had flown into a pig enclosure and chose to eat and subsequently drop his beloved banana over a pen swirling with swine. Boris was one such swine, and keeping with his hoggish nature, had the bad habit of eating any general garbage that was tossed his way. Sure enough, the habit was in full strength this historic night too, and upon seeing the bit of banana magically appear from the heavens, Boris joyously devoured the tainted fruit without so much as a moment's hesitation. The rest of the night would be decidedly less joyous for Boris. That bit of banana did not sit well with him, and from moon to morning, Boris's bowels screamed and cried. There was much happening inside that tiny pig. Monumental things, in fact. That one little piece of banana was wreaking havoc on Boris's innards because of a transformation. Still, in a roundabout way, Boris would soon gain freedom from his intestinal distress, mainly because he was scheduled to be butchered. Boris went from a pen in the jungle, to a cage in a truck, to a corpse on the chopping block of a chef. A chef called Cho, the third name. Cho had been cooking for quite a while, decades even. His father had taught him, and Cho had taught his son. For all intents and purposes, Cho was a master of his craft, which is why he was the renowned head chef of a high-class restaurant. But mastery, as incredible as it is, does have its drawbacks. From atop the high mountain peak of expertise, sometimes the basics become a bit clouded. For Cho, his mind raced with thoughts of complex flavors and finished orders and kitchen cutlery. What he didn't so much preoccupy himself with was washing his hands. Cho hadn't been shy when inspecting Boris's cold carcass. He touched the pig all over, even giving a physical scrutiny to Boris's gums, cheeks, and tongue. And when all that investigation was over, in lieu of soap and water, Cho decided that his chef's apron was the best sink to sanitize his hands. Two quick wipes on the white fabric, and Cho was ready to tackle the rest of the day. It just so happened that part of the day included Beth, the fourth and last name. While Beth's purpose in Hong Kong was business and she would soon leave for Chicago, she had made a promise to herself to visit her favorite Cantonese restaurant before departing. When given the chance to greet the chef behind her delicious plates of food, Beth couldn't have accepted any faster. It was a nice meeting between her and Cho, a picture taken and a few words exchanged. But along with the thanks and appreciation, something much more significant passed between them. It was MEV1, a fomite spread virus that would go on to kill 26 million people worldwide over the course of a year. Unknown to Harry, Boris, Cho, or Beth, this was day one. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed the finished product and could follow along with some of the structural decisions that we made beforehand. We kept to our four crucial characters, switched between them linearly using an omniscient third-person POV, wrote the prose in past tense, and covered our entire scene in a strong narrator voice, with, of course, a few liberties taken. Again, I hope this demonstration could be a bit of a help to you writers out there. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask down in the comments and I will do my best to respond. If you want to support the channel, subscribe or donate through Patreon for awesome perks. As always, it was a pleasure and I will talk to you all again soon.